What kind of food do you eat? You say soul food? Was that the food of African people? Slave food. The food that we find most satisfying. The food that we find that sticks to our ribs. The food that we call down home. A food that we learn to eat in the quarters. And yet we dare say that we have escaped slavery. That we have nothing to do with those people back there. That that was back there. When our whole very social life and social relationships, our very definition of ourselves as a people, our very attempt to commune with ourselves is mediated by the food of slave, of slave, of slave. Soul food, the staple diet of African American life, and a cuisine that serves as comfort food for a large portion of the African American populace. Since food is one of the most important aspects of culture, we must question the means by which these particular foods ended up on our plates. Though there are disparaging rates of diabetes, heart disease, cancer, high blood pressure, and countless other preventable illnesses, the fat-laden, high-sodium, and processed sugar diet of African Americans is rarely listed as a contributing factor. In the midst of the countless illnesses that plague Western society as a whole, we as African people have been taught to rely on a Eurocentric perspective when it comes to health and wellness. But with life expectancies of almost a decade less than our European counterparts, it's time that we approach this subject from a different paradigm. From the beginning of history, indigenous cultures across the globe have practiced an holistic form of healing. Their entire existence worked symbiotically with nature, with vast reaches of fertile land available, we foraged, cultivated, and aggregated into thriving, healthy societies. An abundance of fruits, vegetables, and herbs allowed communities to focus on ascending to new levels of awareness, elevating art, science, and human relations to new heights. Prior to colonization and slavery, Africans fed themselves from the earth. Our ancestors knew that plant life is whole life. They knew that food is medicine. And so because of that, they knew the secrets of using herbs and plants and fruits and vegetables in order to sustain themselves. In addition to sustaining themselves, to healing themselves. So mm -hmm. any illnesses that would arise, knowing the medicinal properties of the, the foods that grew indigenous to the regions in which you know, they lived. Also they had an advantage over our society is because they didn't have to deal with processed foods, with man-made chemical food, things coming out of factories. And so they had to use their food and ingenuity in order to live. 
you have to go back and look at traditional West African diets because that's where the slave population was pr uh, pulled from, the tribes that lived along the western uh, coast of Africa and uh, towards the interior. Those diets were uh, almost uh, entirely comprised of a variety of different plant foods. They were very low in fat, contained no dairy foods, and had very little meat. So they were essentially plant-based diets based on a wide variety of grains, legumes, tubers, root vegetables, nuts, and so forth. And studies show that when people of African descent eat a diet that's essentially uh, uh, analogous to traditional West African diets, that these diets promote uh, greater health, greater longevity, and significantly reduce the risk for chronic disease. It was food that was very nutrient dense, that fed all the systems of the body, fed the brain, fed the heart, you know, um, so everything was available to create an optimal uh, body. You know, we are, as they say, what we eat, so things were available for us to be at our best. They lived in the wild, the Africans at that time, at the beginning of the time, lived in the wild, they ate of the wild. Um, they made the closings from the wild, they drink of the streams, they live and they live healthy at that time. Our African uh, indigenous health lifestyle was basically holistic, which is mind, body, and spirit. We basically uh, consumed all natural foods, you know, foods from the earth, you know, foods from the, uh, from the trees, and fruits from the, from the vegetable plant. So, our diet was basically not on a denatured or a processed diet, but it was an all-natural diet. And that was the way we was able to function uh, with total uh, uh, optimal health, the true dynamics of health, from an all-natural form of living. It's not just the food that they eat every day. It's the food that they've been eating that maintains their biological genius, which is self-healing, self-repairing, and self-maintaining to the best of its ability. Now, some people have what is called traditional land. So if you go to your traditional land, which has been in your family for three or 4,000 years, and you go and pick enough food that you want to carry home with you, when you break off a piece of the plant, put a piece of it back in the ground, it'll grow back the next year. So the fufu, the plantain, the coco yam, those particular things tend to be more of the traditional foods than the cassava, because the cassava was a catch cash crop. Mainly everything was organic, because we were ourselves out there farming and cultivating the land. So, you know, things like plantains, fresh fruits and vegetables, you know, we having chickens or lambs that's out that we're actually cultivating and hunting. So everything was mainly focused from a more organic and natural standpoint. Our people, uh, believed in um, ceremonial uh, food, which meant that they raised whatever they ate, and at certain times they used that uh, to benefit the community. So a lot of times you see on TV or in the books, you see uh, uh, a lot of cows and brothers and sisters with their sticks and making sure that they are fed right and in the right position to uh, you know contribute to the community. But in essence, uh, we the, uh, we grew up. Uh, as you say, in a, a vegetarian state. We only used the meat uh, during ritualistic ceremonies when we had to. So a lot of times that we had drought in certain areas, so they had to use drought situations. Uh, we had much, much, much vegetation, so there's no need to use the meat, you know, and uh, they kept that information from us. So they used the opposite of that here in, in our, in our uh, so-called Western Hemisphere. Mm -hmm. If we think of the diet of Africans before we were colonized, we would think of food that was actually soul food. When we think of soul food now, we think of, you know, the pork, the chitlins, the high cholesterol and the things like that. But what they were really eating was true food that was from the soul, as in the soul sun. So foods that were high energy. So we had, uh, they were gathering lots of fruits and vegetables and grains and things like that. And eating meat wasn't something that they did every single meal, every single day. 
So that's one thing I know that they were not eating <laughs> meat every single meal, every single day. Their food was natural from the source, so they were eating things that were literally from the ground, like coming from the earth itself, so that instilled that connection with the earth. You know, Africans were definitely one with the land, really because their survival depended on it. You know, so, you know, whatever food was grown, either wild or what they cultivated, was the food that they depended on. And that was one of, you know, food that was a healing food, uh, uh, food that nurtured them on multiple levels. So I would say that definitely wasn't necessarily a vegetarian or vegan diet but it was still one that was connected to the land and to nature. The energy that came from them coming from the soil of Africa, which has so much mineralization, kept us very vibrant. Uh, even though we were in the sun, you know, the energy level was high. Um, people could work all day without, you know, um, being burdened by a lot of uh, energetic stress. Um, so they kept basically, the, in the food, kept everyone healthy. When you're considering the fact that we are of the earth as well, uh, well, you know, the earth has certain minerals and vitamins and it has to be treated a certain way, water, nutrition. And so when you have a holistic, you know, comprehension of how you eat as well from the earth, getting those same minerals and vitamins, really replenishing what we already have, so to speak, that, of course, that's longevity of life. You know, you are setting yourself up to be on an optimum energy level and have this vibration and this, this, this vitality, you know, that you would not have if that were shifted in a different way. All indigenous people have eaten in accordance to the land. You know, whatever the land was yielding or whatever they were into hunting, that's what they ate. And it was in harmony with nature. And so, of course, they didn't have processed foods, they didn't have frozen foods, they didn't have preservatives, additives, and all that stuff. It was real basic and it was necessary and sustained them. And in fact, if you're gonna speak about people of color, black folks from the continent of Africa in particular, we used to be the healthiest people on the planet. Even Christopher Columbus uh, and some of his writings his journals, he notes that Africans were some of the most beautiful and healthiest people that he encountered, you know? The pages of history only give us so much before they run blank. We often delve into the realm of speculation when it comes to our indigenous eating habits. What requires no speculation is the means by which our language, culture, and diet were stripped away from us. With unimaginable levels of brutality and force, they imposed upon Africans a diet of refuse which barely even sustained them through the harsh journey of the Middle Passage. Many could not endure the conditions of inhumane treatment. Those who did were subject to the diet which was given by the hand of their oppressor. They usually consisted of cash crops brought in by European settlers, which proved ideal for productivity. Most of these crops had little to no nutritional value, but were only preferred for their high yield and abundance.
they force fed us. Because some people, they didn't, didn't like the food, but it's a combination of black eyed peas, red beans, uh, rice, potatoes, uh, pork, uh, anything they could find, sometimes even coffee grounds. And then they put it all together. If we wouldn't eat it, they would take a sharp chisel, knock out the front teeth, and then stick this pipe down your throat and pour it into a funnel and force feed you. This in order to get you to over a, a one month journey. I traveled on the Black Star Line ship. So the Black Star Line ship, the slowest one I went on was called the Subin River. The Subin River took 19 days for me to get from uh, uh, Philadelphia to Dakar. So a 10 story ship, 90,000 tons of cargo on that ship. It's tossing around like a cork. So you can imagine how the people felt when they were being taken away from West Africa, put in the bottom of a ship, chained just enough space so you had breathing room above the person who's defecating and urinating on you and things like that. It wasn't a pretty sight. So we endured quite a lot of things just to be brought over here. And remember, we were the finest of the African people who were there because they couldn't sell people who didn't have skills, didn't know how to do something, couldn't build, couldn't make bricks, couldn't make tools. And many of the people who were brought over here knew how to read and write Arabic. So there's no such thing as the people all who were brought over here were, were what they call illiterate. Really, our culture got pulled away from us. We, you know, we came into a situation where we were really broken apart from our native roots in Africa. But at that time, and I feel that this is what allowed a lot of slaves to survive was um, those cultural practices. A lot of people came from um, the western part of the continent, you know, practicing things like Yoruba or Ifa. Those were herbalists and priests. It was, it was just for us. I mean, it wasn't nothing that Africans would want naturally. I mean, they, they act like we came over here or like we were just taken from the bushes, running around in the bushes. We had high so societies. They didn't take the worst of Africa. They took the best. They took the builders, you know? They took the scientists, the nurses, the mathematicians, the historians. So these people were accustomed to a whole different lifestyle than what they were being forced upon, you know? So anyone would reject that. You know, it would be foolish of us to think that our ancestors didn't reject that, being forced upon them. You know? I mean, a lot of the food that they gave us on the uh, slave ship was actually, you know, just the scraps, you know, it was what they had left of what they, after they ate. And then they on the ship themselves, they don't have much cargo and food, so it was just whatever what they had, you know, slop, pretty much. Just the, the gruel and the, the bones, the marrows, the fats of, of things, you know. These are their food rations? I can understand why they need an enema. <laughs> Actually, it's not bad. A pint of cornmeal per head, half a pint of beans, half a pound of yams, three pounds of pork fat. Whoa! Get your facts straight. Just two pounds of fat. Look at them. Just look at them. They'll gobble anything you give them. Eating and pleasuring, that's what they want. And they want to survive. They survive everything. Whippings, syphilis, cholera, the heat, the cold. Their strength is their adaptability. Come heaven or hell, they'll fill their bellies and spew out dozens of pups.
When the slaves were brought to America, they were literally forced to eat the garbage of the plantations that they were enslaved on. And so that meant that while the people in the big house got the ham and the pork chops and so forth, the slaves were forced to eat the entrails, the feet, the knuckles, which are the ham hocks, the stomach, which are hog maws, the tails, the ears, and so forth. They were literally forced to eat the garbage of the plantations. Um, when it came to beef, they were given the, the tails and the neck bones, all of the stuff that the master and his family didn't want to eat. Our ancestors ate what they had access to. They ate the scraps and the leftovers. And history tells us that that was the diet of the slave, which is the slave diet. And because we are a creative people, and ingenuity, you know, always play, comes into play. And so what they did was they took the scraps and the garbage and the leftovers, and they found a way to make it taste delicious. We got took away from our continent. All of our foods didn't come with us. You know, things like bananas, plantains, uh, watermelon, some of those things, you know, brought to the continent. But overall, we were took away from our land the things that we were familiar with, and we had to eat and make do with really what they gave us at the time. And this can be, you know, the bowels of a pig, chitlins, this whole soul food thing that's growing. So we got took away from our continent, our herbs. We come practice ourselves um, fully. We cannot practice what we always knew fully because we were just here, you know, beaten and something was forced upon us and we were just trying to do and make do to survive. During that time there was this lack of understanding. You know, we weren't next to the foods that we would naturally be eating. We didn't have the freedom to be able to go and do the some of the things that we you know, well a lot of the things that we normally would do. And so of course being in an oppressive environment uh, with that culture, certain things was given to us and that takes us to where we are now. We had Big Mama, Uncle Joe, Aunt Bessie, all the ones in the kitchen that, uh, you know, in the big house that would take the food and make magic out of nothing, you know, and they were able to create food filled with love that sustained us through our enslavement. Before we got free, we were on the plantation, right? The physical plantation, and we were eating a certain diet, the slave diet, mostly pork, pig byproduct. The slave master ate high on the hall, as a good brother, Minister Malcolm X said, I used to teach, and we ate low on the hall. You know, when we started slavery, you know, in the 450 years of slavery that we've been here in America, that we know that the, 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 uh, the scrap that we was given so much from the hog, the foot, the toes, the ear, the intestines, all of this was scrap, you know, from the table of the mouse. You know, we, we had somehow turned the scrap into a delicate, which we, you know, chilling, you know, how. Uh, black folk love to eat chillings, you know, in the guts and you know of the hog, and you know the uh, the slave master or the, uh, took the the best part of the hog and gave us the scraps, and that's why we end up eating hog feet, hog ears, you know, and you know so I think slavery had given us you know the diet, but we had to take in consideration back then. The hog, they might have been eating the hog, but their workload was heavy. So they was able to kind of tack that by hard work. So we were giving uh, a remnants of foods that were, had no nutritional value, had no substance. So therefore we were forced to be able to uh, spice those foods up, you know what I mean? And, and uh, prepare those foods in a way that was to our survival. But again, that was out of our, our natural diet. Well, I, I tend to correlate slavery with everything. I mean, we are descendants of slaves, a lot of us. So uh, a lot of our problems, a lot of issues we have mentally and physically permeate from that slave trade. I mean, the high yield crops is what we eat, the ones that have the highest yield and we can take our part. Uh, the, um, what we say, the pig feeds and uh, those, those types of things. Uh, we still, as they say, we turn water to wine. We turn, you know, we made the best out of what we could. So the food is very flavorful, but 
uh, the low, this is the lowest cuts of meats and vegetables and things like that. We ate a lot of like greens while others were eating um, turnips and that sort of thing. We ate the least healthy parts of, of the meat. So that's why we have a lot of black people eating, you know, chitlins and um, like all parts of, of the animal that were tossed away while the choice cuts were for um, the people that were in the house, you know, for the slave owners and their families. They have uh, manipulated the, the dietary system to get us to believe that uh, we was low on the total pole and naturally, you know, we, we were slaves and naturally we was, had dog mentality. So therefore, if you're a dog and you, you're on the low total pole, then they give you dog food. They give you the things that's consistent with that, uh, I guess, you say that environment at the time. If you didn't eat those things, you didn't survive. You see what I'm saying? You didn't survive. I mean, from the chitlins, which are basically pig guts, you know, it's the, the intestines that feces run through. <laughs> you know, we were eating that. We found a way to clean it and eat it. The pig feet, the tails, ears, snouts, all that stuff, you know, we made meals out of because it was either that or die. Cooking was mostly done on open pits or fireplaces with large swing black pots and big iron cast skillets. They used large amounts of fat, sugar, and salt to season their foods as they were readily available. With all of the pressures of life in general, food and sustenance were merely a means of survival, even after emancipation. The eating habits we took on closely mirrored the rations we had been given in the slave quarters. We not only clinged to the diet of slavery, we also contributed to and took on many of the dietary habits of the society in which we lived. So while British, Italian, Irish and Jewish immigrants primarily consumed a diet consistent with their particular region of origin. Africans, on the other hand, had no access to the foods that their bodies had been adapted to consume. In terms of the general African-American diet, family tradition seems to play the ultimate role in our unhealthy eating habits. As an ingenious people, we have successfully taken garbage and reinvented it as a comfort food. It's food that brings families together and solidifies our communal and cultural foundation. 
Over generations, we have integrated the eating regimen of slavery into the fabric of our culture. The correlation of this diet to our health is rarely articulated. The question is, how many effects of this diet have lurked within our family and deemed genetic? They claim that uh, when you go to the doctor and you have a disease, they always say it's hereditary. But what's hereditary is the food that they have ate from generation to generation. So we eat because our mom, our dad, our grandma gave us this. However, they eat and get what they got from, the, from our people who were oppressed at that time. We pass along things that we learn, and sometimes we don't necessarily even realize where we got these things from. You know, a lot of us say cancer runs in our family, but it's, of course, what we do that runs in our family. So in my family, there's a lot of cancer, but then at the same time, there's a lot of sugar. And, you know, I learned, you know, from my mother, you know, to make things sweet. She learned from her mother, my grandmother made things sweet. Where did we get that from? That came from, you know, it was like we made do, we're survivors. But, you know, a lot of these things over time is just what's contributing to, to our demise. So we learn how to take things and stretch them. We learn how to take meal, meal, M-E-A-L, so to speak, and uh, make you know, corn, you know, we make all kind of things out of just these staple items for survival's sake. And we carry that tradition on. It's become a tradition and we celebrate around it. But now fast forward and add it with all the processed food and the GMO and, you know, the high fructose corn syrup, you add that to what we were already doing, you know, you have a recipe for all, all these epidemics that we're facing right now. And you know, we, we have to, we have to stop, um, you have to stop. A lot of the diseases that plague Americans today, you know, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, heart attack, stroke, so many are just linked to our diets and what we've been eating over time. And, you know, it's just like me, for example, I can see some older people, mentors, elders, family members, people just in the community, when they get up into their 40s and 50s, their health is really starting to deteriorate. You know, diabetes is normal. High blood pressure is normal. Oh, they had, you know, a stroke, that's normal. No, that's not the way that things are supposed to be. We really don't pay attention to what we eat. Um, especially being in the South, uh, it's very fat-laden pork, you know, things like that. And it's just really not good for our diet. Even as we progressed, <laughs> we're still caught up in that mindset and not really taking ownership and accountability for our bodies. We feel like it is okay to just go put anything into our bodies because it's our bodies and then we want to attach different like religious aspects like, okay, I'm going to eat this whole bowl of chitlins, which I know is bad for me, but I'm going to pray over it and I'm going to pray away all the negativity and all the things that can really, it can do to my body. So I'm just going to pray that away. So it's just like, we have to get out of that whole Western diet mindset because it's, it's not us. African Americans are eating for taste and for what emotionally makes them quote unquote feel good. And due to the fact that it's been a social system provided to, to where the lowest standards of food and the things that we already understand is causing heart disease and different things like that, you know, I feel like most people, contrary to popular belief, I feel like most people are eating just because mama ate it and mama cooked it and auntie fed me this. So I remember when I was a kid at these hot dogs and those type of factors. So I want to say that it's a degenerative diet and just in that word in itself, in the word diet is die. That's all we were raised up on. And the reason we were raised up on it is because we didn't have anything else. Our food was not brought with us once we came here. We, didn't, we don't know what food. We're trying to emulate everybody else. Most African Americans eat to die. They are a part of um, the disease industry, you know, um, either through ignorance, meaning they are in ignorance of divine law, universal law and nature and what 
clearly make sense from a scientific perspective and they are creatures of habit uh, or, or just uh, totally uneducated consumers because you have a lot of those people that just don't know any better. Don't, they don't know that they don't know. There are a lot of folks that know something is wrong but they don't know what it is, they don't know what they can do about it. So they just go along with what their parents have done, what their community is doing because that's just all they know. But then you have the people who do know better and just don't care and that continue to perpetuate the madness. And so, you know, our people are eating to die and blackness isn't gonna save them in this day and time because many of the chemicals that are consumed in the food are heat reactive, meaning that they turn into free radicals when the temperature is raised. So as you have global warming becoming a greater factor in our everyday lives, as you have the chemtrails raining more chemicals down on us, as you have the water supplies being toxified more, and just the everyday stress of being black in America, you're going to see a greater breakdown of our people's health. Uh, when I talk about plantation food, um, I, I, I sometimes use this glib expression that the pathway to health is not to go from the slave quarters to the big house. Meaning that a lot of us, you know, we're eating the, the slave food, the chitlins, the ham hocks, the pig's feet, and so forth. But then there are those of us who've gone to college and we've made a little more money, and so instead we want to have the steak and the, the ribs and the, and the pork chops. All of that stuff is equally damaging to our health and it's equally unhealthy and it will get us killed. We have a suite of metabolic genes that are definitely adapted to uh, energy dilute, whole food, plant-based diet. And when we depart from that diet, it absolutely creates disease. As a people, we're way worse off than we were even 20 years ago. So even when you look back 50 years ago, 100 years ago, even 20 years ago, we can't get away with what we, what, what our mother, not even our grandparents, but what our mother and father got away with. Because, because this GMO game has risen. Um, you know, any, you know, you know these, these uh, foodstuffs, as I call them, it's not food. It's just, it's just chemicals, and you know, a lot of a lot of us are eating these foodstuffs. You know, I mean, when you come off of uh, even when before we even get into the world, you know, the pregnant women are eating garbage. When we talk about diet, as a psychologist, we often look at the intersection between spirituality and diet. And although food diet is critically important, thought diet is as important. I don't think black people, African people, understand the extent to which how you think, every thought is a thing that manifests itself in your physical dwelling. You cannot think a negative thought except to create a negative thought molecule in your body. Every thought creates an atom, a molecule in the person. So a lot of the disease that we're catching is as much related to the impoverished diet as it is related to the impoverished psyche or thought processes of African people. Cancer is being triggered by negativity as much as it is by the foods that we eat. Uh, you look at diabetes. That's being triggered by the anxieties and the fears as much as it is by the sugary sweets. One of the things people have often pondered, they say, well, how can we have vegans or vegetarians who are still coming up with cancer and they eat no animal products whatsoever. How do you explain this? With no trace of cancer in the genetics, so it's not inherited. You have to look at the spiritual diet and, 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 and the thought diet. You can eat well, but that's only one aspect of reality. You have to think well, you also have to live well. And we tend to isolate these. Psychology over here, food over here, lifestyle over here, that trinity of lifestyle, food, and thought or spirituality is three aspects of the same reality. If you take care of one and neglect the others, you'll end up just as sick. Well, many times that particular diet has been just refined to the point that it got chemicals that make it so that I got a cookie one time there and I still got the cookie. The cookie and everything, I, I took it out of the wrapper and laid it over there on top of, uh, of the radiator. 
Do you know the, the, the roaches didn't touch it? The other insects in the house didn't touch it? The thing didn't deteriorate? Only because the preservatives and the chemicals they put on things, they it's supposed to be making its shelf life last longer. So many of the fruits and vegetables and lettuce is sprayed with petroleum. So the petroleum is inorganic, it is not digestible in our system. So you find that when you go buy lettuce and find other particular fruits and vegetables, they're coated with an inorganic substance that the body has to try to eliminate before it can digest and use it as usable substance called food. Because whatever you eat today inside your physical body, it's going to take three days for it to go through the digestive system to become your blood. You don't get energy from the foods you eat today. That's got to go three days later before it becomes blood. And I don't know why people don't just get taught these things in school as natural science. In the Western culture, the foods that we consume has been considerably overprocessed. A lot of the nutrients have been taken out. A lot of the live enzymes that we need to nourish our bodies, they're destroyed in the process of uh, what they call, you know, preparing it, cooking it, packaging it, there's so much destruction. Then they add items into that uh, food that causes it to be preserved. If it's preserving the food, what is it doing to your body? So you're consuming things that you should not be consuming. And that's why we're not, our bodies aren't being nourished like they should be. And uh, the return on that is that you're not getting the nutrients you need, therefore your body is starting to ache and have problems. Then you go and you seek medical attention for that, and the result is you get pills that are again poisoning your system. Here we go again. And the result of those, that food, uh, they're building more jails, or more prisons, more hospitals, and we're still dying at a faster rate. The chemicals, the dyes, the pollution in the air, so you can't run. You could run, but you can't hide from this stuff. It's all over the water. We don't know, we buy in the bottled water, we don't know if it's the right water, it's just all around. Uh, when you look at diabetes, for instance, an African American that develops diabetes is over a hundred times more likely to end up on dialysis over a hundred times more likely to end up blind from the retinal damage that diabetes uh, causes and we're over 240 times more likely to end up with a limb amputation because of poor circulation caused by the diabetes. And that's superimposed upon the fact that an African American uh, man is seven times more likely to develop diabetes than his white counterpart. African American woman is somewhere between seven to ten times more likely. So not only are we more likely to develop these diseases when we're eating the Western style diet, but once these diseases present themselves, they have a much more devastating impact on our health and by extension on our family and our ability to be mobile in the society. There's much difference between um, slave diet and today's diet at all. It's treated as a delicacy now. You know, chillings, you know, you eating chillings. Uh, our people looking forward to Thanksgiving to get them some chillings. You know, back then, you know, we were forced to eat chillings because that's all we had. The dietary habits of African Americans today, of black folks today, well, like most Americans, black folks are not eating healthfully. Most of us eat unhealthful meat and dairy based foods, and it's primarily fast food, convenient food, packaged foods, processed foods, you know, that most Americans eat. But because we have less access to healthier foods in our communities, we, we have, we're poor, you know. Our, we, um, we eat the worst of these foods because that's what's available and that's, what's, that's what we can afford. Um, there are lots of reasons you know, for this and it's, it's unfortunate, but that's the reality. We eat a lot of uh, uh, artery clogging, calorie laden foods for special occasions. Like most black folks are not eating macaroni and cheese and fried chicken and potato salad and pound cake and chitlins and uh, pig's feet and all that on an everyday basis. That's occasion food, family reunions, get-togethers, family gatherings, whatever, right? Even, even 
with that, it can be healthier. People buy the food, they eat, they get full. And the fuller they, they, is, they think they have arrived. They don't worry about nutrition. It's not about nutrition. You just eat and you get full. You could afford to buy a, a six pack or a 10 piece or whatever. You, you arrive, that's pretty good. And, and your kids are asleep and they, they, might, they didn't rest, but you don't know why they didn't rest all night. You don't know why they're running up and down, tearing up your house, you don't know that. But now we are learning. We ate a whole bunch of bad stuff on the plantation when we were enslaved. Now check it. At some point, we got free. Right, the books say 1863, 1865. The point is, we got free, right? Now, after we got free, we didn't have to do a lot of things that we did when we were enslaved including diet. We had choice now, right? Now, it's understandable why we ate the same slave-based diet when we first got free, a year after we got free, five years, 10 years or a decade, a generation, which is 30 years. But peeps, I gotta ask the question, why are we still eating as if we're enslaved. The mortuaries are full of, unfortunately, people of color um, who died more so out of ignorance and stubbornness because they allowed themselves to continue eating a diet that no longer served their ability to sustain themselves. The fact is that African-American men have prostate cancer rates that are much higher than uh, Caucasian-American men. Furthermore, once we develop uh, prostate cancer, it is much more aggressive and we're much more likely to die from it. The same thing holds true for breast cancer in African-American women. African-American women are more likely to develop breast cancer and once they're diagnosed, they're much more likely to die from it than their uh, white counterparts. So th this, this, this idea that, that you know, we need to embrace this standard American diet as a uh, marker for success is really, really uh, not only misleading, but it, it has a devastating impact on our health. And that's why we're seeing higher rates of diabetes in our kids, um, uh, obesity, uh, early heart disease. Um, it is like, for instance, one thing that a lot of African Americans aren't, aren't aware of is that the traditional recommendation for a screening colonoscopy to look, at colon can to, uh, look for colon cancer is 50 years old except in African Americans. It is recommended that we start screening at 40 years of age because so many young African American men are coming down with aggressive, deadly colon cancer. And it's a direct effect from eating all of this meat and uh, uh, sugar and fat that, that uh, uh, one finds in the typical American diet. First, the milk group, which has proteins and the important minerals, calcium and phosphorus, you need to build and maintain bones and teeth. Calcium helps blood clot. It also helps the muscles and nerves act right. Another vitamin in whole milk is vitamin D, which you need to absorb calcium and phosphorus. Sunshine also is important in producing vitamin D in the body. The meat group, which in addition to proteins, supplies iron, thiamine, riboflavin, and niacin. In your body, iron combines with protein to make hemoglobin, the red substance in blood that carries oxygen to the cells. Niacin is important for healthy skin and mucous brains. You know, they call the it the, the, the standard American diet, as you know, also known as SAD. And for African Americans, we know that that developed out of a you know, slave culture where we were, um, you know, we, we had to survive off of what was given to us, you know, the scraps and things like that. And so, the, you know, our diet uh, developed 
to the point where we are now, where really like food, as I would say, is like the modern day slave master. So, um, you know, it's not necessarily about what is meant for us as it was before, you know, with, um, in our native land, but it's about what's, you know, fast, easy, quick, economical, and, um, and just suited for our taste buds that we've become accustomed to. Our taste buds have, you know, kind of been perverted in a sense to, um, a, a, you know, accept things and, and like things that really are not for us. And that really goes back on to us getting out of tune with nature because we have natural laws that we have to follow, just like the seasons. So we must eat accordingly to what our bodies can digest. And the way society has gone, especially Western culture, everything is um, on demand. We need things fast and in a hurry. People don't have, if you go out and you see like a standard family, most people go out to eat because you know the mother and the father are out both working, don't have time. They try to prepare something quick for the kids. So it's a whole holistic thing here when we come into looking at how this diet truly forms. It has many legs, it's like an octopus. We're not centered um, a lot of times in our spirituality, so we're not in tune with our physical health. And this again just really reflects on the society that we're living in. Everything is hustle and bustle, everything is on demand, fast, quick, in a hurry, and we're just scattered. You know, we're just like in shambles right now. We have to get back centered all around. It has to include things like our spiritual practice, our physical well-being, and really just us identifying, becoming back to who we really are and following those natural laws in nature. We've been taken out of that natural lifestyle again into a processed lifestyle. Processed foods, chemicalized water, uh, medications, prescriptions, and things of this nature, right? So we've been taken away from that. Now, the, the important thing is to get back to that. That brings longevity. You know, that brings the true essence of life for the melanated peoples of the world. So uh, we have to include that and realize that and educate, further educate ourselves on that. Your body, our body, any time that we do anything bad to it, it's going to give us a warning. When you're eating starch, foods that's bad for you, it gives you a warning. You, when you don't know it, if you're not cognizant of those, uh, those warnings, you don't worry about it. You go take a roll aid or you go take something to offset whatever that warning was until eventually the body, an organ somewhere goes, oh, I can't take this anymore. So you never have, all of a sudden, have a heart attack. You get warnings for years and years and years. Your organs never just go out. Your liver or whatever major organ just don't stop working. The body is constantly, it's so resilient, it's constantly fighting, fighting, trying to, Earl, stop it, stop it, stop it. By coughing, sneezing. You, your body don't tell you to, can I sneeze? No, something is in there that's got to come out. So, blue, can I throw up? No, no, it don't say that. If you got getting rid of something that ain't supposed to be there. When you have diarrhea, what is diarrhea? Diarrhea is only tell you that's telling you that if there's something in that colon or in your intestine that's not good for you. So what it does, it sends the body, brain sends liquid to that area immediately to flush it out to try to get rid of it. You know, but we don't know that. We just go back the next day or the next hour or whatever and put some more in there, you know, and until this vicious cycle just keep going on and on and on, then all of a sudden you got a chronic disease. We come from a farm community. A lot of stuff, we grow stuff from the earth, you know. It was more organic than what we getting in the supermarket now. They got so much social engineering and they making food, they growing food on top of the ground, not in the ground. You see what I'm saying? I mean, when I was coming along, you could find a peach tree and an apple tree and a pear tree right in their backyard, but where are the trees? We don't see pears and plum trees and apple trees. Most of the kids think that the food just grow in the supermarket. They don't see it in the ground, you know? It's, it's, it's good to be able to plant something with your own hand and eat it from the ground as something that you didn't cultivate it and garden yourself then you get a better sense and appreciation for the food that you grow. Bottom line is this, if you're not controlling your own land, you're not controlling your food source. If you're not controlling your food source, then you're enslaved to whoever it is. You know, you're beholden to whoever it is. So, because our people do not grow 
we don't grow the food that we consume. All kind of stuff is put in it, from fluorides to chloride to you name it. Again, the steroids, the additives, the preservatives, the behavior modification uh, drugs, all kinds of things so that people are experiencing all kinds of illnesses. They are complacent. They are uh, acting out of character in rebellious ways that are not constructive or conducive to life. So anytime you have a people that are consuming on all levels that which is less than what nature intended it to be, you're going to have all kind of imbalances and sickness. Now check this out. If a woman was kidnapped and kept in a dungeon or a basement, and every day her daily diet was water or milk for beverage, bread, and hog egg cheese every day. I know, some nasty stuff, but folks eat that stuff, right? But that's what she was fed every day of her captivity. Then one day, she's rescued. She gets free. And she's brought back into quote unquote civilization or into the society, whatever, right? One night she goes out to a restaurant and she has all this choice. All this choice of food. But she chooses water or milk, bread, and hog head cheese. We would have to look at her psychology. Now, why would a person who is now free choose to eat the diet of her captivity? Well, we can apply the same thing generally across the board to so-called African-Americans. Why are we eating the slave diet when we're supposed to be free? Even with the billions of dollars funneled into the Western health care system, we seem to see a rise in cancer, heart disease, diabetes, and a plethora of preventable diseases, notably in black communities. With very little focus on prevention, we seem to have come to a point where chemical concoctions are paraded as miracle cures. Though thousands die in America every year taking prescription drugs exactly as directed, we often look to these same drugs as the only remedy for disease. One of the least addressed issues brought forth when tackling these ailments seems to be the subject of diet. Um, Western medicine has let us down. Um, and uh, I, I mean, there's, there's just a general problem with the way Western medicine approaches health. Well, what I mean is that in Western medicine, we operate from the disease model, meaning that we are in the business of treating sick people. We are not in the business of trying to keep people from becoming ill. And that's true as far as it goes, but it absolutely begs the question, does it need to be that way? Doctors and people that are in this Western medicine are not there to truly cure and heal people. They are there to put a Band-Aid on the problem and situation and be like, here, I might fix that, but that Band-Aid got this other thing on it, so now you have to go cure that. So it's just like this constant repetitive cycle where you constantly go into the doctor for something else because I might have said I have a headache and I come get this prescription and now all of a sudden, I have nausea, so now I need something else to fix the nausea. So it's, they're doing nothing but benefiting off of us. 
You can go to the doctor right now, next thing you gonna know if your legs ain't broken, nothing, they gonna give you a strip. And then they tell you that 10 milligrams thing ain't working, they tell you to double up, take 40, or uh, take 100. So we're dealing with mar uh, medical warfare also. A lot of those medications have a lot of side effects. You know, they may, you know, treat your system of this, but can cause, you know, kidney failure, you know, liver bleeding, a whole, a whole number of things. They're overly prescribed because we have to think about these pharmaceutical companies, it's business. I just feel as though it's a way to, I guess, manage your illness instead of heal yourself from the illness or whatever you're going through. Western medicine hasn't benefited anyone. Um, you know, Western medicine is really built on mystery and trial and error. Um, I mean, I don't fault the whole trial and error because that's part of the scientific process. But when we look at, again, going versus one where it's trial and error and it's based on drugs and chemicals versus nature, which could be also trial and error, but I'd rather deal with that trial and error. You know, I think I have a better chance uh, versus over here where you're dealing with drugs, chemicals, surgery. Uh, there's no benefit to that. Western medicine is about business and it's about getting you hooked just like any other drug addict into and then slowly basically keep you alive or, or keep you alive um, gr gradually in, in, until you slowly die. They, they don't really care to eat well or do the or participate in the practices that will help them actually heal instead of curving an illness. They want all of us on some type of uh, mind-altering drugs. And we see CVS, Walgreens, and all of these big pharmacies in our community. They ain't interested in keeping getting people well. They, ain't get, they, they get paid to keep you sick. And you know, most of all of us got some type of illness. We, you know, it's almost like one big mentally, mentally ward in our community. Everybody's on some type of mind altering drug. You know, some type of prescription drug. You go to the doctor for a, a particular reason and next thing you know, all they gonna do is give you prescription. Take this pill, take that pill. A pill to wake up, a pill to go to sleep, you know. A pill to think, you know, a pill to have a good sex life. They got pills for everything. They're killing us one pill at a time. The, the way that we choose to pay for medicine by third-party medical insurance means that a lot of how we as physicians are allowed to practice medicine is dictated to us by the people that pay for it. So the insurance companies will pay for me to spend 15 minutes writing you prescriptions for drugs. They will not pay for me to spend a half an hour or 45 minutes with you talking about changing your diet. And so these are some of the things that have to, that have to change in order for us as a country to move more towards a prevention approach as opposed to putting Band-Aids on these diseases once they develop. Any practice that that is not about changing your lifestyle. Now there's some doctors who, who, who would agree that, you know, okay, you need to start exercising more, you may need to watch your diet, this, that, and the other, but it's really, it's not nothing that's stressed because, you know, again, survival. Doctors are just trying to survive just like anybody else. Western medicine is based, is, uh, it thrives off of profit, so, they're not going to seek to heal people because um, healthy people, you can't get rich off healthy people. So, you know, sick people is where the money is. So they're, they want to keep us sick so that they can increase their wealth. Um, there's a lot of money to be made uh, from the uh, uh, diseases that develop as a result of, of people eating this way. I mean, uh, as a cardiologist, you cath people. You open up blocked arteries. Well. I mean, I'm not going to say that cardiologists intentionally uh, uh, don't tell people that they could avoid needing a cath or a bypass if they ate differently, but there's not a big incentive for them to do so. It doesn't pay for them to tell you to change your diet. You know, even if they know the truth, they're not going to necessarily tell you that because it helps them. It helps their wallets. 
and their families. They got houses, they got bills, just like everybody else. Doctors are just like other Americans. They're addicted to eating crap. They are addicted to these high-fat, animal food-based diets, and they don't want to change. And therefore, they don't tell their patients to change because they don't want to have to hear that themselves. The whole thing with, with uh, the Western perspective of what medicine is, is more in of a Band-Aid effect, right? So it's more of a cover-up until, right? And so the thing is, is that with that perspective and that understanding, you don't truly get to the root and the cause of it, right? And so I believe that it's helped in the idea of getting rid of that initial pain, um, getting rid of that initial, you know, what, what have you. However, in the overall perspective, I believe it hasn't touched yet into the cause of what's going on to truly heal people and not so much have them dependent on a prescription. Now, of course, you know, there are some individuals that have benefited from uh, Western medicine, but overall, it hasn't benefited us at all. No, and it don't, really don't even benefit Caucasians either. Uh, allopathic medicine has its place. Um, it's beneficial in catastrophic events and scenarios where you actually absolutely have to have something replaced. Um, and, and it's kind of designed similar to uh, a body garage where uh, when you have something that needs, uh, like, you know, with your car, if you need a transmission replaced, you have to go and get that fixed. But um, if you maintain that transmission, it's not going to break down. So I don't fault the doctors, I don't fault um, the industry because there are a lot of people in the industry that are trying to survive and most of them unfortunately don't know any better. They believe that, 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 that their truth is truth and, and even if they're you know, even if you show them another way, they will reject it because that's what their survival is based on. It's already been established how he's going to treat your symptoms. It's not like he's coming up with anything new because if he does, then he's in, uh, he has the potential of losing his license. If he's innovative, it's already set. This is how you're going to treat knee pain. This is how you're going to treat a headache. This is how you're going to treat chest pain. I mean, it's already set. All these different tests, it's already. I mean, the proof is in the fact that insurance companies, as well as uh, Medicare, they ain't gonna tell you what they're gonna pay for. What is that? Unless it's, the treatment has already been established for that particular problem. It's already established. So it doesn't really matter what you ask him because it's already been established how he's gonna treat you. One of the persons, one person who to me has more respect than anybody in the world in the, in, in the Western him just, People would just do whatever. A person in a white coat. You go to the doctor, they say, oh, you're having to, okay, what do I gotta do, doctor? Or the doctor said, you know, I can't eat this, this no more, and I have to take this medicine. And we don't question those things. We don't get to the root cause, okay, if I got high blood pressure, I know it can kind of be because of salt. Oh, he says it's hereditary. Is it really hereditary? Can I fight this? Can I prevent this? Kind of like we just take it at face value and just say, okay, this is it. This is my destiny, this is what I'm doing and I'm confined to. Instead of saying, how can I combat this? How can I fight this? So we have to get that power back and it comes back with knowing and getting into some knowledge. Because a lot of the things, they can be prevented. Now, when you are feeding your body and your body's functioning optimally, really Western medicine has no place because it really doesn't address being healthy and whole. You're not really truly here to heal the body, and you can't heal the body without healing the body, mind, and spirit. So it's like once you take all those other things away from us, that's not really truly actually like healing someone. And that's what the, the doctor is supposed to do is truly like help heal this process. And it, you can't compartmentalize mind, mind, body, and spirit. If someone is dis in their body, they're also dis in their mind, they're dis in their spirit. So you have to put all those things together holistically. Western medicine treats each organ as if it's a separate entity not connected to the rest of the body. Yes, it may be a separate entity, but it's connected to the body as a whole. So you're doing a disservice, or Western medicine does a disservice when it treats the heart as if it's not connected to the rest of the body. You know, specialization is okay, 
but it's not holistic because it separates and breaks down and makes everything disjointed. And that's why, you know, not only is health breaking down, our communities are breaking down as well. Vaccines, drugs, surgery, chemicals, uh, these things are just to basically allow us to, to continue to eat the, the lifestyle that most of us are, are hooked to. It's too much pain and too much inconvenience for us to change our lifestyle. So Western medicine is designed to keep us eating a poor diet. It's just, just as simple as that. So it has done a good job, you know, because it's like, look, you, if you eat such and such diet, such as food, even if your heart stopped working, we can give you a new heart. Even if you gotta get, you know, your gallbladder removed, you gotta, so they'll start cutting stuff out of you in order to keep you alive and to keep you living versus trying to heal and to regenerate oneself. Uh, so, so that's Western medicine, medicine's job. Western, Western, Western medicine's job is to keep you eating poorly. Because again, and then, and then who is that benefiting? That's benefiting the agribusiness. That's benefiting all these false food stuffs. You know, that again, it's business. When you're miseducated and you begin to eat food that causes body parts to break down to the point where they basically need to be replaced, Western medicine is the place to go to do that. They're not working, and you're taking this thing, you're thinking you're doing something. You're taking these pills every day, sometimes 10, you think that you're nourishing your cells, you're getting iron. It's the wrong, it might be iron, but it's the wrong iron. So they're getting paid, because to make one and pill, they're selling you for $150, or maybe $25. It only costs one cent for that pill and it's not what you think in there. So they are benefiting, they're getting rich. And richer corporations is, they're really rich. While we are in the, in the hospitals. Oregon, at the penitentiary, because we can't think right, we can't process anything right, we don't have the energy to, to even have a whole conversation, we always on 10 mad. It's crazy to even think that medicine is an industry, the pharmaceutical industry, and all these things are playing like hand in hand. The hospitals are in bed with the insurance companies, and they're in bed with the doctors, and who are in bed with the pharmaceutical companies, who, and it's one big mafia ring, um, and they all benefit from people getting sick. So it's not, and, and, and again, in our economy, that's good for the economy. It would be awesome. If people collectively said, okay, you know, we're not taking this anymore, we're all going to do our part to be healthy on a larger scale, we're going to shut down these hospitals, we're going to shut down these pharmaceutical companies, uh, we're going to shut down these, uh, these research centers for the, for the new vaccines. Now that we know enough to know that certain types of diets and certain lifestyles promote chronic disease, shouldn't we, as physicians, then make it our, our duty to warn people about the dangers of the way they eat and live? And unfortunately, not very many uh, strides have been made towards uh, moving in that direction. Um, unless you decide that what you're being told is not the proper way, then you're going to continue to eat that way. You're going to continue to poison your body. You're going to continue to be sick. You're going to continue to go to the doctor and get three, four, five prescriptions that the prescriptions are counteracting each other, and you get you get another prescription to counteract the prescription that you're taking. It's a vicious cycle, but we're not acknowledging that.
In recent light of alternative methods of healing in the mainstream, we have seen an influx of interest in herb, vegan diets, and holistic healing. Health food corporate giants like Whole Foods rake in massive profits providing organic and health conscious foods. The perceived financial burden of a healthy lifestyle has become overwhelming for many African Americans in particular. With an average median family income of almost 20 times less than that of our white counterparts, lack of finances is usually the primary deterrent to those who would even consider a healthier lifestyle. Um, the role that socioeconomic status plays is huge. Um, and I think we all know that. We all know that there are food deserts um, and low-income black communities, which means that there are not a lot of super, supermarkets available. Um, there are not a lot of farmers markets available. There's not a, land, a lot of land to grow uh, your own food, community gardens. Um, there are not a lot of CSAs or community supported agriculture um, uh, organizations to get food directly from farmers. And so, um, and that's, you know, that's basically an economic issue. Nearly half of all of our children grow up in poverty. Poverty dictates a certain type of a diet. A very low income, a malnourished, a very sweet, a eat on the go type of a diet. You give somebody a choice. If somebody has to choose between putting a roof over their head or in buying um, fruits and vegetables, they're going to opt for um, having somewhere to stay over picking healthy foods and then go to McDonald's and get a burger for a dollar or something. But if I'm worried about um, keeping my lights on next month, then I'm not even trying to worry about trying to eat healthy. I'm trying to survive. We have to uh, improve the uh, economic state of our people so that um, they won't have the worries of trying to um, survive day to day. Um, no, because if, if I'm you know, living good, then I can buy you know, whatever I want. It's hard to have a nice diet if you can't afford to buy it. Feel what I'm saying? It's hard to have a nice diet if you can't afford to buy it. It's expensive to eat healthy. Cash savers here in town is in the hood. You go out to Lake Hamilton, where Harvest Foods is, and her harps is. You cannot get the same type of meats that you can get at Cash Savers, where they give you all this, you know, six for 25, bottom of the barrel type meat, all the neck bones, all, the, all that stuff, all the dang, you know, all this mess. When you go out there to that Harps or that Harvest Foods or that new Kroger's out town, you getting choice cut meats, but they can afford it. The first thing you always hear is, is oh, well, eating healthy is expensive. It's too expensive, I'm sorry. Eating healthy is too expensive that, you know, you always hear. Well, in fact, you know, you look at it one way, you're gonna pay for your health one way or another. You can do it in a preventative way to prevent those diseases that, that we suffer from, that you, you know, that we mentioned, um, the disparities that we're high on. You can prevent those diseases from coming, a dis-ease, or you're gonna pay for it within the medical field some way or another with medication and things like that. So I feel like we make it more of a, of a, of a um, uh, problem than an uh, issue than it is. Originally, um, my, my first point on that would have been, you know, poor people, they have to make do to get what they need. And I feel that that is true to a certain extent because you can, I, I, and I see people in a, when I'm in a grocery store buying, you know, highly processed foods, TV dinners, things like, you know, Rotel, XYZ, and saying, you know, groceries are really high. I understand that, but you got to look at the packaging. You're paying for a lot of stuff that's um, already prepared or you just heat up in a microwave and that's more costly versus you going to the store, buying some whole grains, buying some you know fresh fruits and vegetables or canned, canned fruits and vegetables. Buying those and actually preparing them so that it ties back again into the time constraint because a lot of people are working, 
they're stressed out and they just try to make something fast for their kids and their families or themselves. It really doesn't cost a lot to eat healthy. I mean, you really don't. I mean, if you're doing, if you, you're doing it sensibly, you know what you're doing, like, you're not gonna get a, a, a week's full of vegetables that you're not gonna eat. They're gonna spoil. So knowing that you're not gonna do that, you're gonna reduce money spending and you're gonna get what you need. You're gonna learn how to eat more accordingly to your habits. Uh, good sister of mine, she always say when you go in the grocery store, you should spend more time in the vegetable area than anywhere else. And you should always, you should frequent the, the vegetable area at least three, four times a week. You should always stock up on fresh vegetables. And by doing that, you will reduce spending money on going out to eat and things. I mean, you look at the average meal, say you go somewhere like super fast food, McDonald's, Wendy's or something. The average, what, what is like, $8 or something like that, $10, averaging nationally. I mean, $10, you can get a lot more food than that one little meal, you think about it. I contend that uh, good food ain't cheap and cheap food ain't good, you know? So it's better to eat less and eat the best, you know? And then we had to take responsibility in our diet too. You know, we go to the store, we looking for the pick five, you know? And the pick five is where you get five different kinds of meat at one time for uh, 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 a cheap price, and not guarantee that the meat ain't been in somebody's storehouse for two years, you know. But the idea that pick five is a whole lot of meat, and we tend to buy anything long as a whole lot. And so, you know, we and you know, there's a disparity between what they sell in the inner city and what they sell in the suburbs. We find that the food is better. And sometimes I, I I contend that you know most of the, the supermarket in our community ain't nothing but dumping ground. This is for this is for food that went bad. That they somehow sell it cheap and get it off to us. And we the kind of people that if you make it cheap, we ready for it. It can be cheap anything, you know. Just give us a truckload. When you look at the true cost of food, it's not really a financial thing. The true cost of food is whether or not you're going to go out in your backyard or, or uh, in a bucket and put your hands in the dirt and grow something. Because I grew up in the South, we didn't have much. Yes, it was a farm belt, but how, however, we had a backyard garden. My father brought home some produce from work, um, but most of our stuff that we ate around home came from the backyard garden. How much does that cost? Some seeds and some time. So, you know, it, it's a matter of perspective. When we look at things from the socioeconomic perspective of today, it's horrendous. But when you, when you put it into uh, the framework of holistic and being in touch with nature and actually beginning to revitalize culture, the culture of actually being out there in the dirt, in the sun and growing your food, it becomes, uh, uh, it becomes something that really does, doesn't apply, you know, because if I can grow enough food to feed my family in my backyard, what difference does it make how much money I have? No matter how poor we are as African people, we can improve the quality of the food that we eat by educating our parents on how to prepare it for themselves. Okay, community gardens, and not only that, now the technology is such that you can grow crops in your house if you have the right technology. I know several Africans who have the farm indoors because they live in a place where they don't have access to land. So there's so many different ways we can improve the health of African people through education and opportunity. I think that's one area that we have to become more sufficient at. I think there's one area where our scholar warriors who are very adept at that type of science really have to step up and start giving back a little bit more to get our people on the right track. Poor people were eating more things that were from the earth because they had to grow their own food and they had to rely on themselves. But rich people would be the ones that will feast out when they will have access to all this meat and all these different things like that because they just had, they had sugar, they had all these different things that they could afford it. What you're looking at is that when people get richer, you assume they can eat better. That's not necessarily the, the way it goes. You uh, get richer and you consume more of the poison. You can consume bigger steaks, you can consume um, more milk, you can consume more ice cream, you can consume more of the foods that are just you know, killing you in your body. Then you turn around and go to a doctor who gives you all this medicine to counteract what you yourself did.
and what they're still doing right there in the hospital. You look at the trays that come in, they got the same food they're feeding you, and then pills to counteract it, hospitalizations, surgical procedures, all that. When it boils down that if you hadn't had all that money, you may not have eaten all that food. But the quest for economics doesn't allow us to be able to stop and cook a meal, you know, an easy meal. We would cook something processed, whether it's processed beef or whatever. Uh, Hamburger help was real easy to make if you had five kids, you know. But a lot of us don't know, I mean, these kids don't know what an avocado or a mango looks like. Other issues that come to bear are simple things like access to care. Um, traditionally, access to good health care has been a problem in a lot of African American communities because many of us are from low income communities. And one of the the really uh, negative uh, uh, impacts that, that um, one sees in our community is that you have a family that is struggling to raise itself out of poverty, uh, send their kids to good schools and so forth, but they're eating the traditional Western style diet. And then what happens is the primary wage earner gets sick. Um, the father or the mother comes down with diabetes or has a, a heart attack that leaves them a cardiac cripple and then instead of the family being able to funnel resources in to educating their kids, getting them into you know advanced placement courses or academic uh, 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 programs, all of the money then has to go to taking care of you know dad and his diabetes or big mama and her you know heart disease and as a result it drags the family back down into poverty. When we talked about race, what's in your location, what's in your environment, we can't like take that out of the picture and just say African Americans are more linked to obesity and diabetes and high blood pressure just because they're African American. We have to look at the whole environmental aspect too. So it's like not that, okay, we still stuck in a slavery mindset too, but it's like, what's around us? When you go to the hood, what do you see? Liquor stores, churches, convenience stores. Like that's when you get you a family dollar. Like if you really think about it, and maybe the grocery store may not even have that much produce, but it does have a lot of processed food. So we can't even just like put that out of the, like the whole conversation because we have to really think of what's being, like what's in our cart. Right now, like every time you see like a food desert or a food swamp, that's what it looks like. <laughs> no grocery store with like enough produce in order for people to really truly live out a healthy lifestyle. Like I would have, you would have to go travel out to go get quality produce and that doesn't make sense. That's an injustice and that's a disparity. The advancement of um, uh, technology, they've learned to um, make, extend, this, extend the shelf life of their food uh, at, the, at the expense of the health of the masses. And, um, with that, you know, they saw the opportunity to make big profits on their, um, on whatever they were producing. And they even, you know, figured out how to use every single aspect of an animal, like from the teeth all the way down to the, to the tail, or to the earwax. <laughs> I don't know what they're using. You know, they're making gummy bears out of bones and stuff. So basically, um, we all know, you know, the four food groups, and then there was the pyramid, and then now there's the my plate. And basically, that's when the U.S. government started to tell folks how to eat, the USDA. And that basically started because uh, during World War I, back in 1917, the federal government basically wanted their troops to be healthier and the laborers at home to be healthier. And so when people were enlisting, they found that there, that there were all these nutrient deficiencies. And so they decided to issue guidelines so they could have healthier troops to go out and fight war. That's really how these guidelines got started. And um, generations later, people, you know, they were recommending um, what people should eat and so um, so that they wouldn't have nutritional deficiencies but generations later decades and decades later they found that people were getting these nutrients but they were actually overeating and so they were having dietary issues chronic disease issues because of overconsumption and so the dietary guidelines then started to tell people to eat less of certain things to get healthier so the food industry um, you know, decided or realized that that was affecting their profits. And because the food industry is about making money and not creating healthy citizens, it's not a nutrition, you know, they're not nutrition uh, social service agencies, as Marion Nessel likes to say. Um, they're basically about profit for themselves and their stockholders. And so 
they decided that they had to get the federal government, the USDA, to stop pe telling people to eat less of the foods that they were producing. So through campaign contributions and lobbyists, they got that those dietary recommendations changed, and that's basically what we're seeing today. These dietary recommendations that the federal government issues every five years are primarily based on um, profits for the food industry and not health for Americans. When the food industry was industrialized in the 1950s and, and all this mass production of food started to occur, that was a boon for the food industry to the point that we now produce more food than is, than is needed by the U.S. population. The USDA's purpose is to not only tell Americans what to eat, but also to make sure that there are healthy profits for the food industry. And so they're talking out of both sides of their neck, right? And the food industry makes sure that that balance is shifted towards them, towards profit. So that's really where we are when it comes to food. The food industry is the largest industry in the United States, period. It's all about them getting rich and we getting unhealthy. That's what the plan is playing about. The rich, the masses is getting rich while we are heading to the hospitals and to the penitentiary. And we all have to go there because that's where we're heading. That's, what we, that's what's going on. In addition to tradition, our eating habits tend to be highly influenced by media and advertising. Deceptive ads and product placements specifically target African Americans with high sodium and sugar laden junk foods. Billions of dollars are spent on marketing via native ads, focus groups, and even on staff psychologists. At less than 13% of the population, African Americans consume more media per capita than any other ethnic group. The almost inescapable influence of corporate advertising is truly a driving force in our health disparities. Media propaganda, uh, aka advertising, is huge. Advertising rules when it comes to why we eat what we eat. There's no question about it. The food industry is the largest industry in the United States, period. They, the industry spends more than $35 billion a year on food advertising. And so a lot of people think that they're too smart or sophisticated to have food advertisement determine what they eat. But the reality is 70% of all food advertising that you see on television is for fast food, junk food, sweets, and snacks. Only 2% is for fresh fruits, fresh vegetables, whole grains, foods that we all know are good for us. This is what the food industry is all about. It's basically about healthy profits for industries and not creating healthy citizens. It is a well-known fact that fast food restaurants target uh, communities of color. So you drive through inner city communities, there's a KFC or a Burger King or a McDonald's on almost every street corner kind of interspersed between the liquor stores. Whereas if you go out to the suburbs, you don't see that. And so number one, they target us and then they try to make us think it's cool to eat, you know, their food. So, you know, if you want to be cool, you want to be popular, you eat at Mickey D's, you know, and they try to make it sound very interesting. KFC has this big thing where it talks about the convenience of, you know, of bringing home uh, fried chicken to your family. Now, it doesn't tell you what's going to happen to your family if they eat that crap, but they just tell you that it's convenient and that if you buy a bucket, they're going to give you a cake. So they make it really easy to buy this food that's number one subsidized by government subsidies and then they try to make us think that somehow it's cool and, and will be popular and we will and that eating this way equates with success. And so those are all sort of subtle psychological messages that they try that they use to try and convince people that if you want to be uh, perceived as being successful, if you want to be perceived as being cool, then you need to eat this, you know, this food that, that we're selling. Uh, but as I said, they don't talk about the negative impact on, on your health because once they have your money, they don't care what happens to you. You know, we love, as a people, we love media. And we love entertainment. You know, we love to watch the tube. 
we're totally influenced by the television. People will go and get up from watching television and see a KFC commercial and go buy a tin pack or whatever they sell nowadays. And that's not an exaggeration. Uh, these different milk products, these cereals are loaded with sugar. What do you do? The child sees it on TV, Mama, I want that cereal. She gets up and does what? Goes to the store, buy three, four boxes, not just one. I've seen them in the checkout line. Sure. It's pure sugar, and the advertisers have won because they got you to buy that product. Then your child loves it, and you go and buy more. And the story just goes on and on, and the list goes on and on. So we're not putting nutrition in our body. We simply put these poisons, this sugar in our body, this, these hormones from these uh, injected chickens from the different restaurants. It doesn't really matter where it comes from. KFC, all of them. But um, the, that's our American diet now. And I'm, I'm just maybe a five-year vegan. So I've got uh, over 60 years that I was on that side of the fence. And I'm not gonna lie, I actually, well, oh, that KFC has a two-piece, that sounds good, with honey on it. Oh, well, that's what we're gonna have for dinner tonight. I thought I was feeding my kids right. We lose more people from drive-throughs than drive-bys, you know, and it's okay. It's, it's, there's, 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 there are no charges to be pressed. You know, it's the coolest crime that's being committed, and it's, the, you know, it's become the norm, you know, murder king or whatever you want to call it. Um, you know, it's just a huge problem that's been normalized through the media. Well, the media play a great role in what we eat because you see it on TV. Matter of fact, you know, they try and get McDonald's in China and pretty soon with this Iran deal they just made, they're going to have McDonald's in Iran, you know, because it's all about commercial, you know. It's all about greed, you know. They dictate what we should eat. Through, work through a process they call subliminal seduction. You know, we can go sit in the, uh, a one of these fast food chains and we don't know why the, all the tables is orange and the, and, and the chairs is orange. That has something to do with increasing your appetite. You know, so, you know, all, all these are mind doctors. These are doctors of the mind. They create, uh, they create the influx of old eating, you know, so suggesting to us that through the commercialization of food, you know, what is good and what is bad, you know. I mean, oftentimes we go to the grocery store just to get a loaf of bread and we come out with a whole basket full of food because of the power of subliminal seduction. If you're advertising for, say, McDonald's, it looks good on TV, which makes, and your mind is like, oh, I want that. Like, it looks, it looks juicy, it looks, it looks well put together, blah, blah, blah. Of course, because it's a commercial. They, they have to dress it up just like you put makeup on people. When you go to the store, it doesn't look like that, but you don't even think about that. It's just, I saw this, the message is in my head, I'm gonna go get it, now I'm gonna eat it. Continuously eating that crap is just gonna make you feel and look like crap, or be, or it's just gonna bring you down. If you look at a lot of our neighborhoods, the fast food restaurant chains predominate in all of the black neighborhoods. This is not a coincidence. When the black community came under attack, by the CIA and FBI in the early 70s, late 60s. When the crack was dropped off in the 80s, the mass incarceration of black men led to the disintegration of the black family. Capitalism, seeing this, rushed in to capitalize on the fact that black people were no longer operating as family. If we're not operating as family, we're not eating as family, which means that we're often eating alone and on the go. The fact that many black parents have to work two and three jobs to pay the bills dictates I gotta get my breakfast on the move, my lunch on the move, my dinner on the move. So capitalism saw this and they said, hey, we can get paid off the fact that black people are often on the go and have to eat as they go, that they have to eat a low uh, energy diet, a low income diet, and then on top of that, they're not eating as a family, which means they're spending more time outside of the home. So this situation, believe it or not, our diet is largely related to the systematic destruction of the black family. There just isn't enough time in a day. Time to fight the traffic, to get to a job I can't possibly get done from nine to five. Time to run to the bank, stop at the post office, rush home, cook and clean. Mommy! Oh. Well, tonight, McDonald's is making my family dinner because there's no way I can tell these big brown eyes. 
that mommy doesn't have time. A lot of times, you know, focus groups goes into the spot where they get, gather people after they tested a product to get their feedback. A lot of psychology goes into it. Symbols, colors. Cornerstone hires kids to log into chat rooms and pose as just another fan of one of their clients. To buy it. You think this may be just some compilation of, oh, they just, you know, chose this for this box of cereal or this candy bar, but colors have emotion, they vibrate at a certain level. You know, branding, emotions that are tied to that particular product. You know, you got like a sports drink. Oh, if I drink it, I'm gonna, you know, have more endurance. When I want endurance, I'm gonna go straight to the thing. So they tie so many things to that product and service and they market that. And when you're getting flashed with that on TV, newspaper, ads popping up on your cell phone, it's going into your subconscious mind. You may not recognize it consciously, but it's slowly going there. So the next time you say, you know what, I'm a little tired, I need some more endurance. I gotta, you know, do this five mile run here today. Uh, what should I drink? Should I drink some spring water? Or should I go get this, this sports drink here? Cause I know it's good for endurance. I really don't know, but it says it's good for endurance every time I see it on a commercial or the TV. We could talk about the food that we ingest from McDonald's, which we know is poison. Even in McDonald's, they have, they tell their employees, don't eat this food every day. Yet there are millions of people who eat the food every day, the consumers. Yet they don't even want their own people eating the food every day because they know it's not good for them. We want to do Captain D's, Mickey D's, the D's D's, and we are Italians, and we want to be everything but what, I don't know what an African's supposed to eat. If you can take a chicken that would take 90 days for, to get a good fry, and you can develop a chicken in six weeks, then you got to tell you something, you know. That's why we see people, our young people wearing size 13 shoes. We see young girls coming on the mental cycle at nine years old because of the food, the diet itself. The diet is, the diet is, is part in itself. So we have to be very careful what we allow to put into our system, you know, you know, because it have a direct effect on how we think. Whether it's a commercial on the radio or on the television or in the movies, uh, peer pressure from family members who have been eating a certain kind of way forever, you know, since slavery, um, friends and so on and so forth. I mean, even people that get high and they smoke an herb, most of the stuff is uh, GMO herb. Unless you're growing your own marijuana, you are dealing with genetically modified organisms that are in the marijuana that are causing all kinds of problems for people. It's all about ignorance. We didn't know. We put faith in these people. We put faith in what? What we saw, see, what we see on TV because of ignorance. Not that because that we were ignorant, because, I mean, that not that because we weren't smart enough, it's because we haven't been taught. We wasn't taught these things. We faith put in faith and what these people were saying, these doctors and things, these people were saying that, oh, these things are good for you. You know, they, they, I mean, they are chronic liars. I mean, they lie to us all constantly, all the time. Lying, lying, lying. It was designed to do just that. I mean, from, from its creator, it, its creator, uh, what's the guy named Sidney Freud's nephew, Edward Barnet? I mean, he's like the master of PR. You know, he created propaganda to do just that, influence people to make emotional choices rather than rational choices. It's kind of funny that there's so much money put into it because these things are already highly addictive, like sugar and salts and stuff like that. But I feel like, me, especially children, media plays definitely a big role in our children. In a, and so many children are being raised right now by the television. So it's so scary to even think like how, what are they being fed? Like, what is their reality? Like, because as a child, I mean, they're so innocent and pure. Now, what's, what are they being fed and told? And now this is starting to shape truly who they are. Like, so we have to be careful of our children too and what they're being fed because at least we as an adult, like we have the mindset, okay, well, I can maybe compare and contrast but if you're not saying nothing and they constantly being fed and told like this is okay through media, through the school system, through everything that's outside of their, their circle, their tribe, what are you really setting up your child for? Advertisers target African-Americans. They target children. 
And so we're, we're really getting the brunt of it. There have been studies that show that, you know, af that show that fast food companies um, target African-American uh, families and children in particular with their unhealthy products. And unfortunately, when you see national conferences, national black conferences, uh, for whatever uh, subject matter or uh, organization, a lot of them are sponsored by McDonald's or Pepsi, you know, which is outrageous. It's outrageous. Um, and this has got to stop. I consider it almost criminal, you know, because you, you are impressing upon, you know, young minds. You're exposing them to, to these things. Like, we wouldn't expose our children to, uh, you know, certain things that we consider to be deviant behavior. We wouldn't expose them to pornography and all that sort of thing. But we're, it's, it's legal for them to, for the media to uh, just, um, you know, flood our children with all these commercials that impress their mind. And, uh, you know, and it makes it, you know, it, it just changes it changes their mentality, and so like with me, even though you know I should send my children lunch to school when they you know get to school because the the dominant culture makes it everything else normal, you know then they feel like something is wrong with them because they have something so called you know healthy, you know, and so it makes it makes something healthy the alternative as opposed to the, to the standard, you know, and it's like if you go in a grocery store, a regular grocery store, and they have a health food section, you know, then it's like, what is the rest of the store to be considered? And, you know, it's because of the mentality and, you know, all the influence of media that, that makes it supposedly okay. I mean, you know, you used to be, you used to be able to, to find uh, lots of cigarette company ads in black magazines way past the time that they stopped advertising so much in white magazines, you know, but, you know, and, and it's an economic issue. I mean, I get that. We don't get the same funding and grants and underwriting from corporations, but we've got to do better. It's not acceptable that McDonald's and Pepsi and companies and, and KFC or whomever else or whatever, whatever other companies are, are advertising um, through our conferences, you know, pushing this food to us. So um, there's advertising in, in all of these kinds of ways that affect um, what we eat. And um, the way to fight that basically is to arm yourself or arm ourselves with information and knowledge. And it's not just that it's advertising that we see on television, but it's advertising that these corporations do at health conferences also. Um, the American Dietetic Association and other nutri nutrition organizations, they underwrite their conferences, right? Which means that they're gonna promote and push their food and it's going to affect what they dictate um, or what they say to their clients um, about what to eat. When I was in graduate school at New York University, um, I asked my professors why they promote or they teach a meat and dairy based curriculum when they know that plant based foods are healthiest. And, my, and the answer I was given was that they, the USDA requires that they teach a meat and dairy based curriculum in order for them to retain their accreditation. Ridiculous, but it's true. And then uh, someone uh, went on to say, a professor of mine went on to say, well, you know, most people don't want to give up meat and dairy anyway, so if you push plant-based foods, you're not going to get as many clients. Well, what about the ethical considerations of that, you know? Um, so, but there's, but that's, but that's propaganda as well. One, you know, that, that um, even in nutrition schools, the USDA requires that meat and dairy is pushed. One of my professors, um, was instrumental in creating the Got Milk campaign and was talking about that in class as if that was a good thing. So it's everywhere. It's everywhere. And, you know, we, I, I call it guerrilla nutrition. We have to really get in there and arm ourselves and fight against that. If I get the kids to eat two or three green beans, I think I've done my job as a mother. 
So I'm being honest with you. This is what we're facing. That's what a lot of mothers are still facing. And it's still a battle to get children to eat better. You've got to learn what's a better way to eat. Unless you decide that what you're being told is not the proper way, then you're going to continue to eat that way. You're going to continue to poison your body. You're going to continue to be sick. You're going to continue to go to the doctor and get three, four, five prescriptions that the prescriptions are counteracting each other, and you get pres- you get another prescription to counteract the prescription that you're taking. It's a vicious cycle, but we're not acknowledging that. We're still thinking, oh, I'm feeding my child right because the TV told me so. You don't say the TV told you, but that's where you got your knowledge. That's exactly where you got your knowledge. The solution starts with you, yourself. What can I do to help the betterment of my people or people in general? So it's just like, what can I do? What can I bring to the plate? Because a lot of times we're looking for this savior complex to come and save us versus like really being accountable for myself. So that's one thing, know thyself. It's a lot of like different initiatives to come out here to wake people up, to show them the culture and who they are as a people and who they can be right now to this day. Some people don't know where to start. It's a lot going on. So some people are like, I really just don't know where to start because I don't see a way out. So it takes more of us melanated, rich people who are actually conscious in these areas to go back into these communities and work together. It's really simple. Uh, going back to our roots. As uh, Dr. Imhotep Leo Africa says, you know, an alkaline diet is one of the best diets to have. 80% alkaline, 20% acidic. Simple, simple uh, ratio. And uh, the more we include giving our bodies and allow our bodies to respond to an alkaline base, an alkaline environment, the more the perfected the body will become. The more uh, of stamina, the more endurance, the more uh, longevity the body will have, you know. Eat natural, you know, natural. I'm not saying everybody has to become a vegan or a vegetarian. I'm not saying that. If you're eating your meat, just try to get everything as natural as possible. You know, try to go to a farmer's market where you actually know the people who are growing the foods. Or try to grow some fruits and vegetables yourself. That way you know where your, your food is coming from. Um, I believe the first thing is application of information, of correct information. So gaining knowledge, learning what's good, as he said, what combinations of food will work. Um, not just, I'm just going to take what I used to eat and try to make it healthy, because that's not going to cut it, you know. Um, so I would say a big thing is knowledge, meaning the application of correct information. Uh, also, us coming together and having more media that w- we can teach people. Well, one solution is what we're doing right now. Um, sending a message out to, the, to our masses. Uh, the information has to be out there in order to know. Back in the 50s and before, people didn't know how harmful tobacco was. Now everyone knows that, but people still smoke. That's their choice, right? It's going to be the same way when it comes to meat and dairy. Most, more people are going to know how harmful it is, and 
they're going to make the choice about whether they're going to continue with it or not, knowing that they're hastening their death and they're hastening their disease. But, they, but the knowledge has got, to, has got to get there, and that's the social justice issue for me. It's about healing our people, liberating our people, moving our people closer to freedom, justice, and equality. The way that we can tangibly do that is to start by educating. And so that's what we do. You know, here at The Raw Reality, we educate not only um, about the food, but about other things spiritually, about things politically, about things in terms of the community and how to build stronger families and so on and so forth. So, you know, that way people are able to um, consume on all levels mentally, physically, spiritually, and emotionally. A lot of people can be having those same ideas, those same things that are going through their head, but they feel like they can't do it. But if I have a sister who like, oh, I wanna do a healing farm too. I'm like, oh, okay, so it becomes more possible. So just bringing that creative space where people can actually talk and be able to share the ideas and what are the solutions that we can do together and collectively as a whole, I feel like it's key. It's gonna take, uh... Uh, they say knowledge yourself, and I'm not talking about like learning where you come from. I'm talking about who you are and some of the things. If you lie, why do you lie? If you skate, why do you skate? If you like this, maybe your mama skated, maybe your daddy was into this, and trace it back. And then the traits that you don't like, you know, if you're overweight or whatever, then correct them. And don't be afraid to correct them. A lot of times, we, we built up the black pride so much that we won't correct ourselves. We'll say, yo, I'm this and I'm proud to be this. I'm proud to be overweight. I'm this and I'm fine and happy or whatever. And that's not so. You know, we're afraid to take responsibility to say, yo, I wanna, I wanna change for us. Cause ain't nobody gonna come help us. Ain't nobody gonna come down and they're not gonna do food programs. They're not gonna do music programs. You know what I mean? And so we're gonna have to educate ourselves with videos like this or whatever. We're gonna have to get into it and understand why we got all these problems, you know? Food is beyond personal choice. You like fried chicken, so you can't give it up. You know, well, if it's killing you, and if it's killing your family members and your friends, or if it's causing you disease, if it's going to shorten your life, if it's going to increase your risk of obesity, stroke, cancers, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, you're more likely to get breast cancer, die of a heart attack because you eat meat, you eat fish, you eat chicken, you eat pork, you eat turkey, you eat eggs, you drink milk, you eat ice cream. It's not worth it. But but you have to know that, and then you can make the decision. But the fact that you don't know is the crime to me. The fact that you don't know, that you're, that you're systematically denied this information, that's the issue, that's the social justice issue. Once you know, you can decide what you wanna do. Knowing thyself, knowing thy history, knowing thy culture, Sankofa looking back in order to reach forward to go get it. I feel like we have to look back because we have to know truly who ourselves. And it's not like you don't even have to look back far. You can just talk to your people, talk to your grandma, your great grandmas, and just learn that true rich history. You ain't gotta go all the way to back to Africa all the time. You can go straight in your neighborhood and learn about the history and the culture of the neighborhood and your people. Aside from just even health, I want to say first thing is, is in all aspects of life, seek yea the truth. Seek the truth. You know, seek the truth for what it is that makes you know you healthy. Because whether we want to admit it or not, nobody wants to be sick. Nobody want to have a disease. You understand what I'm saying? So if you seek the truth, and then you will learn through education or dedication, more more so to speak, then you will be healthy and you will be happy. You understand? Happy is not a destination, it's a journey. You can heal yourself, you can gain more energy, you can look better, you can clear your skin, whatever, whatever you want to do. You can do it by knowing what and how to eat for you. So that's the biggest thing is just knowing and wanting to know. We are original people, so we have to get back to the original makeup of our behavior, which means doing for self. And the only way you're going to uh, be successful in any community, you have to do for self. We have to come together as a people to love one another, care for one another. I know it's just easy to say, but it's going to be done. Get back to the basics. Yes. Get back to the basics. The basics is where it's going to, it's where it started. The basics is where it's going to end. So we get back to the basics. And as the words of our Motebi says, heal thyself. 
and we have to return back to our uh, divine nature as the gods and goddesses that we once were dealing with hell. Dealing with, or really, not just dealing with hell, but just holism all the way around, mind, body, and spirit. You have to include those things. These are not separate entities. There's one body. So that's why I say, heal thyself, let's return back. Unless we decide to become accountable and stop blaming everybody else for stuff they have always done, for things that they will continue to do, and decide, you know what? I'm not going to participate in the madness anymore. I'm going to be a rebel with a cause. I'm going to be a modern day revolutionary and choose life. As we have evolved and now we're in a state of being able to really reclaim our own destiny again, we have to be willing to change our diet to a live it, meaning that we are eating to live rather than eating to die. And thus it allows us to really be modern day revolutionaries without having to pick up a gun or throw a grenade. We can simply choose life, i.e. choosing live foods, healthy foods that are promoting life and thus allow us to defy the death industry. Number one, we gotta educate the children. It's gonna be difficult to make any lasting change to any people or any community if that change is not normalized into the culture. Right now, eating healthy is still a marginalized area of activity for black people. It's a, uh, what do we, it's an eccentricity. You know, it's a specialty. Eating healthy is a specialty amongst black folk. That's a problem. Because if it's a specialty, that means most people do not do it. We have to normalize it. And in terms of normalizing it, one of the critiques I would have of the vegan and vegetarian community, don't be so extreme at first and introduce an African people to an alternative diet. A lot of our people are being influenced away from going holistic because the holistic practitioners are coming at them with an all or nothing proposition. You cannot give a baby solids, you gotta feed them baby food. Don't tell them that they can only eat these types of vegetables. Don't tell them that they can't eat no animal products at all. Slowly grow them, meet them where they are, slowly wean them off the meat, slowly wean them off the fish, and take them from that stage all the way on up. I think we're being too aggressive in our intent to improve the health of our people, and it's not improving them at all, improving the health at all. Extremism, I don't care if it's dietary extremism, I don't care if it's spiritual extremism, political extremism, ideological extremism, religious extremism. It never works in the long run because the average human being isn't equipped or interested or has the motivation or effort to live an extreme life. So if we want to bring veganism and vegetarianism to African people, let's do it in a very realistic, practical, and patient fashion. Let's get away from the all or nothing proposition because we're going to lose more than we gain. You have to meet people where they are. And the thing is, is that once you meet people where they are, you have to meet them a level below that. When you're learning trigonometry, they start you out with just like the basics, just so you know that and you have to build from that. And I think having, well, I don't think I know having that institution as far as health and fitness, fitness is, you know, it's, it's circulating, increases circulation, it's a healing process. It's not just you getting big, it's so much deeper than that. And once we get people to truly understand that, then I believe that will be one of the major turning points that we all have to come together on and take responsibility as one and as a collective in order to push that agenda. We meet people where they are and we take them to help take them to where they want to be. Right. Mm -hmm. And as African Americans, we are used to whole soul food, flavorful food in general. And the process is learning how to still enjoy that food, but enjoy it in a way that you're, you're loving your body while you're eating. So instead of me going to McDonald's or Burger King and getting the fries, I'll go get some carrot sticks and celery and have some great hummus dip or ranch dressing. You know, start where you are. You know, choose an apple over the bag of potato chips. If nine out of the 10 times you've chosen the apple over the bag of potato chips and that one time you want to have the potato chips, have the daggone potato chips. Don't guilt trip yourself. Love your way through the process of good health. If you're, a, if you're a prince or a princess, a king or queen, you demand to, to eat that. You demand to bring that into your life. You demand that your children do that because your children are royalty. And so, so you know, I mean, if, if you had royalty coming from England or whatever, you're not going to free, feed them, you know. The scraps that's left over from the, the food that you made before, the night before. You're, you're going to take the best. Yeah, you're not going to feed them processed cereal and anything. You're going to find the finest fruits and vegetables. You're going to bring in the best flavors and, and serve them. 
How much more should you do for your own children? Uh, you know, we need to uh, individually challenge one another. And, uh, you know, we need to continue to, to work together. And, and, you know, there's a lot of healing that has to take place. There's a lot of trust uh, that has to be developed. Uh, you know, slavery has done a number on us spiritually. So there's a lot of healing spiritually that has to take place as well. Uh, so it's not anything, I think anything that, um, that is worth achieving, even if it doesn't happen in my lifetime. You know, that's how we have to think. We have to start thinking generationally. We have to, we have to start thinking in terms of legacy. Like, nothing is accomplished in one lifetime. You know, we have to start thinking about our great-grandkids and, you know, starting to establish traditions and, 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 and values. Um, and, and so again, it starts with the individual, it starts with, you know, our families and things of that nature. Um, but I think in terms of, you know, really creating real change, real significant change, it's going to take some time. And, and we have to be patient and we have to endure. Uh, nothing happens overnight. You know, we need to create organizations, create plans, revise the plans. Uh, and, and continue the good fight. We got you rebels now. That's what you are. Dare to think for yourself. Exactly. You, you guys, you, some may write, you know, you some way clicking right, so you now. say, oh no, this, this is not working now. You know, something is wrong. And, and it was, it's been in me for years. I mean, it's been in me for years. Uh, but uh, you always need help. It's the little things every day that matter. Because the decisions that we made in the past is what built us up to the person we are in the present. Exactly. And the decisions that we're making in the present is what's creating the person we will be in the future. And if we will be in the future. You have choice nowadays. And now you choose to eat slave food, slave-based food, the slave-based diet. Why would you choose to do that with all of the opportunities that you have today? Raw foods, vegan foods, plant-based foods, even your continental diet. Why would you not do that? That's something to think about. Seek holistic professionals. Pro professionals who understand that everything is one and that massage is massage and it's great, but guess what? In order to really benefit from the massage, you need to exercise. From the exercise, you need to eat right. From the eat right, you need to think right. You need to meditate. Doing these different things, they're all truthful. And so when you find the truth, then it'll keep taking you to the same place. And whether you're trying to run from it or not, hey, that's your choice, but at the end of the day, you're gonna know the truth. So seek the truth and then that shall not set you free, but make you free. You know, again, it's about sustainability, self-sufficiency, you know, determining our own destiny through us um, reclaiming every aspect of our life. Taking that time or getting some of the information to say, I really can make a difference, I can stretch this out, or I can try to prepare meals this way and spend just a little bit more time to make a healthier choice for myself, my kids, and, you know, my family or my community. Educate yourself on the different varieties of food and learn to cook. I think that's a big part of it. You know, we don't cook. I think people would eat fresher if they had the time to. Whatever little thing we can do, um, you know, to invest more in ourselves is like, you know, coming to places like Seven Nanda, but also growing our own food. You know, taking time to cook more at home. You know, sometimes it's, it's uh, you know, not as convenient, but fellowshipping more you know, around food, but um, around good food that's, that's feeding life as opposed to feeding, you know, the opposite and continuing what we were taught and that we never stopped to think about where it, you know, if it was really for our best interest. Our daily decisions make the difference. Right. When you make a decision as an individual to go in a certain direction, 
You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a transformation that has to take place. There's a detoxification that has to take place. And detoxification is never a smooth process. You know, it's usually, it's usually, it usually comes with some pain. So we, we, collectively, we have to go through a detox. We have to go through some discomfort. Be willing to be uncomfortable for a minute with changing your taste buds. Um, and, you know, for the sake of not just yourself, but, you know, we have an impact on our whole family. Um, you know, people do what everyone else does and the generations to come. But the question is how? The right. real question is how? A lot of people, they want to do better, right. but don't know how. And that's where we come in. We compassionately lead them along the journey of how, and we share with them what we've learned in our decade and a half plus of, of, of discovery and right. learning and the exploration. Process. And it's about those yes. daily decisions, right? Yes. So am I going to eat whole grain bread instead of white bread? Am I going to drink soda or drink water? Mm -hmm. It's about the little things, every sing, single thing that you do every day mm -hmm. makes a difference. And the path is the journey. So you might mess up today. Mm -hmm. You might go ahead and have a steak. No, I'm just saying. <laughs> you, might, you, know, no, you, might, you might. When you're on your process right. and on your journey. And, and that is one thing that we've, we've found sometimes, and it breaks our heart when somebody says, yes, I was, I was doing so well eating vegan, and then I went to my mom's house and had her fried chicken. Or then I went to so my I cousin's quit. house and I, I just quit. You know, and, and that is, and we say, you know what? Don't quit just because you went back to your old habits and what you used to do. It's okay. You know, have compassion with yourself and move forward and keep doing it. The, the most important thing is to eat more plant-based foods. And uh, I know that people, a lot of people say, oh, I could never go vegan. And I used to say that, honestly, 30 years ago. I didn't think I could either. Um, so just start by adding rather than taking away. I always encourage people to add. So that means starting with adding more greens to your plate, dark leafy greens, um, and swapping out uh, white rice and white pasta and white bread for whole grains, um, quinoa, brown rice, black rice. Um, there's millet, there's um, buckwheat, there's amaranth. There's so many grains, whole grains that people can eat instead of white rice and white pasta and white bread. So adding uh, dark leafy greens, whether it's kale or collards or turnips or um, spinach, mustards, dandelion greens, so many greens that you can add. That we don't have to any longer accept just anything. You know, I mean, we are live living people and we must feed ourselves live living things, you know, like we matter. Mentally, make more rational choices than emotional choices. I would say physically, exercise one hour a day, exert yourself one hour a day, make your heart rate, heart rate build up and really, you know, get to doing something, stay active. I would say do that every day you live. And uh, you just, you know, Every other way up, just take it in moderation, you know. But definitely work out, work out, eat, eat, make better choices as far as eating rationally, and everything will be all right, you know. Drink more water, things of that nature, less soda pop and all that, you know, booze and whatever vice you may have. I know it's a hard world we live in, so people have things that they choose to, you know, medicate and get away. But do everything else in moderation. But if you, I, I truly believe that if you exercise an hour a day, make more rational choices than emotional choices and not eat, be a binge eater and things of that nature. And eat, uh, eat to live, not live to eat, you know what I mean? Actually, watch what you put in your, body, in your belly. The issue of food is affected by racism and this, this false notion of white supremacy, this, you know, this system of white supremacy that we live under. Food is not exempt from that. And, um, I have to say that, you know, all of this is intersectional. Like there, you know, there's a lot of talk going on, um, not just a lot of talk, a lot of movement, action, activity around Black Lives Matter about police brutality against um, black men and women, black boys and girls, right? And Operation Ghetto Storm had this report that's, that showed that there were 300 plus extrajudicial killings of black people by police officers, security officers, and vigilantes every year. And I think that report came out in 2010. Three, 300 plus people, right, killed this tra in these tragic ways. 
300,000 African Americans die of primarily diet-related chronic diseases every year. 300, 300,000. Now this is, not a com this is not like a game of comparison. This is to show that both of these are preventable tragic deaths. Right? And these are interrelated. So there's genocide, there's 21st day lynching going on with the 300 deaths, 300 plus deaths. But I also think that this, these 300,000 deaths from diet, from lack of information, from lack of access to healthy food, this is also a, a social justice issue. And this is also about genocide, you know, and there's no, there's no way around that. And it is up to us to change that, to become aware of it. You're protesting all of these things, but you don't see the connection, you going to McDonald's and eating food that's going to hasten your death and hasten your illness and disease. Make the connection, and that it's still true today. That's the connection that people need to see. You know, if they're out there fighting for Black Lives Matter, fight for Black Lives Matter. That, that is about what you eat too, before, during, and after the march. We have to have more access to food, you know, the injustices um, in, in food access in our neighborhood, you know, and so there's a reason why there's a dialysis center on every corner as opposed to, um, you know, a natural foods market. So even going back to things like growing our own food, like, and starting to be able to supplement, I'm not saying that you can grow enough food right now to sustain you and your family, but grow a tomato plant. Like just start getting yourself in that mindset and taking baby steps to get out of this, come out of her. And Cause this system isn't really meant for you. It's meant to oppose everything that you do. So you have to start taking those baby steps in order to become more self-sufficient and sustainable and become a tribe, like a tribe of people. So you may not necessarily know how to grow food, but your neighbor might. You might know how to work on cars. He, somebody else might know how to do something else, but just coming together as a collective unit and getting out of that slavery mindset. Well, I tell you what, if you give me 40 acres, I'll be the mule. That's one good step because I'm, I'm gonna say the prayers and be as humble as I can. I'm gonna be respectful and treat the plants that I eat in a sacred manner so that the, the, the woman who's in my presence and company and the children can feel the sacredness of how we live every day. So I think there's gotta be some sanctity and some sacredness. Come back to our ritualism. As a matter of fact, water is older than we are. And do we say thank you water for being here to, get, to clean my skin? and make me presentable so I can go see other people and not be offensive. So I'm thankful to be here in the garden where natural food is grown. And I have more of a, of a say-so as to, as to what I eat here. Whereas if I go to the grocery store, and of course I do for certain items, but um, I do much less of it because I have looked at what I like to eat and what's best for me and I've planned accordingly. If you uh, like uh, to have a nice salad every day, then grow your lettuce and tomato, radishes, onion, garlic. And the most amazing thing is while we have learned through our journey how to transform our eating habits and create something better, what we discovered is that the same habits apply to every area of our life. Right. And that was, the, that was an amazing discovery for us because we were able to change our finances to something better. We were able to change our relationships and our environment. And so we're not just li living healthy plant-based lives, we're living healthy whole lives. lives. right. Right. The world belongs to us just like anybody else. And so we can exact our will on the world. We might have to be tricky about it. We can't just run up on people and say, give me this, give me this, give me this. We might have to be slick, we might have to lie, we might have to make, cut some corners or whatever we have to do. But you can do or get whatever you want out of life. It's just gonna take some, some of this. So that was my, my part, to, to try to influence some people that look like me or came up like me and to say, yo, look at him. If everybody is going back and healing their own households, putting their own households in order, then guess what? We'll all be better for it. Then we can come together as whole beings, as healthy beings, and create a healthier environment here on the planet. 
So, you know, what I'm saying is ultimately for all people to heal themselves. First and foremost is for people of color, particularly people of African descent, particularly the people that were uh, victims of the diaspora, the, the ma'afa. For us to be able to begin to become accountable, to say, you know what, the buck stops with me. I'm gonna make a difference. I'm the one I've been waiting for. We are our ancestors returned. And so it is. Okay, I'm Charlize Lowe and I am the Marketing Member Services Manager here at Sabananda. We're located in Atlanta, Georgia, 467 Moreland Avenue in uh, Little Five Points is the area. We, we, we are a natural food store. We've been in existence since 1974. Uh, Mr. Ayu Witu just walked in the store and he's one of our members here at Sabananda. He's been with Sabananda since how long? Charter member. Charter member. Long time member. Seven Under is not just your average natural food store. It's everyone's home away from home. Um, we, people don't just come in here to shop. They come in here to get love, to give love. Seven Under being a natural food store, we are not only a natural food store, but we're also a co-op. Uh, and, and being a co-op, that means that we're owned by the people. Uh, we have a membership here of over 3,000 people. And we're ran by the people, so that has a lot to do with the decisions that are made here at Seven Honor. They're made by the people. So we're not a corporate, uh, corporation. So our drives are for members. Uh, all of our things are organic. Uh, uh, they're locally owned by the farmers here. Uh, we do not sell no meat in the store. We don't sell alcohol. Everything in here is vegan and vegetarian. You, you just wouldn't imagine the people that come in here. We have stars that come in here. Uh, like I said, uh, Andre 3000 was just in here last week. India yeah, Irene comes in here. Chili from, uh, uh, from uh, what is it? Uh, T -T TLC. TLC, yeah, I should know that. But today, the end thing today is healthy eating. So a lot of children nowadays, they're, they're really interested in, in, in eating healthy. I had a young lady she was 12 years old that came in a couple weeks ago and did a little thing here at 7 on and she runs track. And her thing is she didn't want to eat those foods and drink those foods that they considered healthy. She wanted to do the celery and, and she wanted to eat food, but she wanted it to be healthy. So like I said, now here today in these days and times, the end thing is eating healthy and 7 on sets the basis for that. That's what being a natural food store is. It's, you know, it's natural. I mean, people don't want all those chemicals and things uh, in their foods and in their, in their, you know, soaps and waters and things. And that's that's what we came to. That's what Seven Arms is all about. This is pretty much uh, Seven Arms. Pretty much Seven Arms. Totally vegan menu. So we've got everything from veggie burgers, quesadillas, barbecue nachos, gumbo, some um, sweet potato fries. It's all over the place. Cupcakes, cakes, ice cream cakes, whatever. You name it, we'll make it. Vegan, right? Building the veg came out of necessity. I was really, my eyes were opened up to eating habits through my partner, Jamel Denham. Uh, he's a vegan for about 10 years. And so um, just being friends with him, we, I would eat some of the food he would eat and I realized I didn't need 
as much or any meat in my diet. And then once I realized that there wasn't an option for us, 65% of my customers are black. You know what I mean? And I don't think it's the support thing. Because I tell, I tell, like I tell local rappers, like I don't want to support you, your music. I want to enjoy it. You know what I'm saying? If I enjoy it, I'll buy it. And that's just what it is. So um, I felt like we put a great product out. And, and the people around me now are eating vegan food in my neighborhood. Our motto is, anything, anything you, you can, can make, make, I can, can make, make vegan. And that's what we want people <laughs> to say. At the end of the day, we yes. want them to know that anything you can make, you can make vegan. Yes, and, and you can reach us at www.anythingvegan.com. Um, we have um, always, if you put in your name and email address, you'll get all of our delicious free recipes. We have a free ebook about helping your family transition, helping your children to love plant-based eating. We love sharing the journey that we were on and sharing all the knowledge and information that we learned to kind of cut down the time for other people so that they can get right to it and eat delicious. I'm asthmatic, and uh, so one of the main things was uh, dairy products actually causes. It's one of the oh sorry, it's one of the triggers for um, of asthma, and um, the doctors don't really tell you that because of course they want you to like you know they want me to keep buying you know inhalers and pills and so on. So um, so yeah, so it was really actually it was pretty severe, and um, after doing like, some research, I realized that. Um, dairy was one, you know, was the main uh, main cause. So um, when I did the, I was vegetarian before I went vegan, and then once I did like you know uh, my research, I just cut off dairy, and I saw like a lot of improvement, and of course like weight loss, so that helped. I was going back and forth to the doctor a lot. Um, I had traces of lupus, and they were trying to diagnose me with um, fibromyalgia for like the chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and stuff like that. And so immediately when I stopped um, eating any animal products, um, I began to notice a difference that I no longer go see a doctor at all. I no longer have the um, chronic fatigue and chronic pain that I had prior to changing my diet. So after actually seeing the effect that it did for me personally, I knew there was no going back for me. In 2007, I, that's when I did the switch. Uh, my parents were like, there's no way you're going to do that. <laughs> and I was like, no, I'm actually going to do it. And I started, you know, gradually um, cutting off, like, plant, uh, I'm sorry, cutting off animal products, obviously. So I started, you know, as a vegetarian, and then I realized that I might as well just cut the crap. And, you know, went vegan right after. Uh, I'm the only vegan in my family. Um, I get... I get the, I get stuff for it all the time, which is normal, you know. I, after a while, you kind of grow a uh, uh, tough skin, I feel. But I, I just found it 
you know, weird as to why they think, like, you know, eating a plant-based diet is so peculiar. Like, it's really, you don't realize that you eat, you know, you eat vegetables every day. That's plant-based. So, you know, I, I don't understand how it's so extreme, but it really isn't. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, until, the, until now, you know, they respect it. You know, I mean, I'm not going to change, not going back. It's been a few years now, so it is what it is. But, um, you know, I definitely try to kind of educate them and like tell them like hey you know why don't you eat this instead of that you know whenever we go out or whatnot uh sometimes it's hard to accommodate you know they want to go to like the barbecue place and stuff like that and it's like all right you know but um i guess to each his own you know i don't force my beliefs into anyone so but I, I i will say that the more they see the more it influences them and, and already by doing that that's you know that's already perfect so that's my take. As family, I have kids, and my kids are currently redoing the transition for them. And I find it hard to convince a child than an adult, because an adult, you can make your decisions based on you know better as an adult. But um, the argument that we have with my kids are, well, you introduced me to me. Why do we have to do this now? And I actually had a conversation with my son yesterday. He said, so are my taste buds going to change? Because I have meat taste buds right now. And I said, yes, your taste buds will change. I said, but look at the benefits of it. You won't be sick. You won't, you, you won't have all these ailments and these issues. And you'll be, have a healthier lifestyle. And I was telling him that it's no point in me doing this if I'm not going to educate you and allow you to live the lifestyle that is more healthier for you. So, at first, they were like, ill, yuck, you know, and, and that's just normal kids' reactions. And I think it's very candid to see that perspective from kids because they are, you know, they're full of, you know, life and they are not as tainted as adults. So, being able to have those conversations and have them, what i um, having them do is help me prepare foods so that they know that they prepared the food and um, it helps them understand what's going into their bodies, understand that they help prepare the food and they're not so ugh about it. So certain things like tofu, we can't, they, they haven't, they don't like tofu right now. So, but it's just, I told them, it's just like a learned behavior. Once you begin to eat it and explore different options, then it'll, it'll come together. But I think as far as the rest of the family, everybody calls me weird and strange and why am I doing that? Not, like, really none of my friends are vegan or anything like that. So they're always like, well, this is my vegan friend. <laughs> but everyone's like, oh, well, we can't go here. Or we can't go there because you can't eat that. I'm like, worry about yourself and what you're going to eat because I will eat when I get there because I know how to modify anything on a menu. Exactly. They act like it's like rocket scientists exactly. to tell them to hold the cheese, hold the meat yep. on a freaking taco right. or something. It's, right. it's not that big it's of a deal. So, it's so crazy that they're like, oh my gosh, you can't eat here because they serve me. Guess what? I went to, what's the name of that place? Poco de Chai with all the meat. Really? You went there? I spent $75 on a salad. Because they don't have an exclusion option. But I went because it was someone's birthday. I didn't go for the food at all. But we just ate off the salad bar. Like, there was not, even though it was like a galore of nastiness <laughs> meat around. But I'm still able to go places. I'm still able to live my life right. as I choose to live it and eat my plant based diet. I guess it's about food choices and actually becoming more active, um, live a more active lifestyle. I know like traditionally everything we do is centered around food. Right. Someone graduates, we have a barbecue. Someone gets married, we have a reception. Someone dies, we eat. You know, so everything we do is surrounded by food, heavy foods, greasy foods, you know, and we can just provide more um, healthier options, I believe, at those times and, and just open our minds a little more on what we eat and not be so taken back because we say, oh, this is a plant-based meal or this is a vegan meal. When most of the stuff there at the 
eat, eating gatherings are vegetables, but you just add all type of meat stuff, which is not necessary. Like spice, it's all type of spices and stuff to give stuff flavor and stuff, right. natural flavors. And so I just think if we let food be our medicine and not our comfort, that we'll go further. And if we become more active as a whole, then I think as a society, as a black community, we we can, if we work together as a whole, that we'll be good. I mean, it's pretty much now. As, you're pretty much as it is. That's exactly what I was going to say. Um, yeah, I mean, especially like you mentioned, you know, food is everywhere, so. Just be more conscious it, of what you get. Yeah, exactly. No, definitely. Um, I don't find it hard, you know, like, I, I don't like it when people say, I can never do it, it's too hard. Yeah, it's really not hard. It's not hard. Um, it's, to me, it's not hard. I mean, look at here, like... It's like choosing what you're going to wear today. Right. I think that's harder than choosing what right, I'm going exactly. <laughs> <laughs> No, definitely. Um, no, I mean, it's just like here at Whole Foods, you know, like the hot bar has like mac and cheese, you know, barbecue, like tofu. tofu. And it's, you know, the options are here. I think it's just kind of like to actually stepping out of the box you know and not even the box just like being open-minded about it you know and that like you know like oh no you know i was raised on barbecue and ribs and i was like i can mean i can make you some tofu ribs right now right <laughs> you know it's just an, it's just you know it's playing with food and i feel like you know if we it's, it's very easy to to um to transition you know to transit and you know accommodate i think it's just about you know the, aware, the awareness of it and you know the education, like you know about it, and not just like, oh wait, you know you vegan, you only need salad and tofu. Like no, there's actually more. <laughs> so yeah, but uh, yeah, I think it's growing though. You know, I think it's, it is. it's going there. Yeah. It definitely is. It is, especially in Atlanta. There are like a few um, very good. There's a lot of um, options now, and then there's also like um, I think there's about two or three. Um, Caribbean vegan uh, cafes here, so hey, it's here. Just gotta find it. <laughs>